The Ice Palace by F. Scott Fitzgerald The sunlight dripped over the house like golden paint over an art jar, and the freckling shadows here and there only intensified the rigor of the bath of light. The Butterworth and Larkin houses flanking were entrenched behind great stodgy trees. Only the Happer house took the full sun, and all day long faced the dusty road street with a tolerant, kindly patience. This was the city of Tarleton in southernmost Georgia. September Afternoon Up in her bedroom window, Sally Carol Happer rested her nineteen-year-old chin on a fifty-two-year-old sill, and watched Clark Darrow's ancient Ford turn the corner. The car was hot. Being partly metallic, it retained all the heat it absorbed or evolved, and Clark Darrow, sitting bolt upright at the wheel, wore a pained, strained expression as though he considered himself a spare part, and rather likely to break. He laboriously crossed two dusty ruts, the wheel squeaking indignantly at the encounter, and then with a terrifying expression he gave the steering gear a final wrench and deposited self and car approximately in front of the Happer steps. There was a heaving sound, a death rattle, followed by a short silence, and then the air was rent by a startling whistle. Sally Carroll gazed down sleepily. She started to yawn, but finding this quite impossible unless she raised her chin from the window sill, changed her mind and continued silently to regard the car, whose owner sat brilliantly, if perfunctorily, at attention, as he waited for an answer to his signal. After a moment, the whistle once more split the dusty air. "'Good morning!' With difficulty, Clark twisted his tall body round and bent a distorted glance on the window. "'Tain't morning, Sally Carroll.' "'Isn't it? Sure enough.' "'What you doing?' "'Eatin' an apple.' "'Come on, go swimming. Want to?' "'Reckon so.' "'How about hurrying up?' "'Sure enough.' Sally Carroll sighed voluminously and raised herself with profound inertia from the floor where she had been occupied in alternately destroying parts of a green apple and painting paper dolls for her younger sister. She approached a mirror, regarded her expression with a pleased and pleasant languor, dabbed two spots of rouge on her lips and a grain of powder on her nose, and covered her bobbed corn-colored hair with a rose-littered sunbonnet. Then she kicked over the painting water, said, "'Oh, damn!' but let it lay, and left the room. "'How you, Clark?' she inquired a minute later, as she slipped nimbly over the side of the car. "'Mighty fine, Sally Carroll. "'Where we go swimming?' "'Out to Wallace Pool. "'Told Marilyn we'd call by and get her and Joe Ewing.' Clark was dark and lean, and when on foot was rather inclined to stoop. His eyes were ominous, and his expression somewhat petulant, except when startlingly illuminated by one of his frequent smiles. Clark had a income, just enough to keep himself in ease and his car in gasoline, and he spent the two years since he graduated from Georgia Tech in dozing round the lazy streets of his hometown, discussing how he could best invest his capital for an immediate fortune. Hanging round, he found not at all difficult. A crowd of little girls had grown up beautifully, the amazing Sally Carroll foremost among them, and they enjoyed being swum with and danced with and made love to in the flower-filled summery evenings. And they all liked Clark immensely. When feminine company palled, there were half a dozen other youths who were always just about to do something, and meanwhile were quite willing to join him in a few holes of golf or a game of billiards, or the consumption of a quart of hard yellow liquor. Every once in a while one of these contemporaries made a farewell round of calls before going up to New York or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh to go into business, but mostly they just stayed round in this languid paradise of dreamy skies and firefly evenings and noisy niggery street fairs, and especially of gracious, soft-voiced girls who were brought up on memories instead of money. The Ford having been excited into a sort of restless, resentful life, 
Clark and Sally Carroll rolled and rattled down Valley Avenue into Jefferson Street, where the dust road became a pavement, a long, opiate, millicent place, where there were half a dozen prosperous, substantial mansions, and on into the downtown section. Driving was perilous here, for it was shopping time. The population idled casually across the streets, and a drove of low-moaning oxen were being urged along in front of a placid streetcar. Even the shops seemed only yawning their doors and blinking their windows in the sunshine before retiring into a state of utter and finite coma. "'Sally Carroll,' said Clark suddenly, "'it a fact that you're engaged?' She looked at him quickly. "'Where'd you hear that?' "'Sure enough, you engaged?' "'That's a nice question. "'Girl told me you were engaged to a Yankee "'you met up in Asheville last summer.' Sally Carroll sighed. "'Never saw such an old town for rumors.' "'Don't marry a Yankee, Sally Carroll. "'We need you round here.' Sally Carroll was silent a moment. "'Clark,' she demanded suddenly, "'who on earth shall I marry?' "'I offer my services.' "'Honey, you couldn't support a wife.' she answered carefully. Anyway, I know you too well to fall in love with you. That doesn't mean you ought to marry a Yankee, he persisted. Suppose I love him? He shook his head. You couldn't. He'd be a lot different from us, every way. He broke off as he halted the car in front of a rambling, dilapidated house. Marilyn Wade and Joe Ewing appeared in the doorway. Lo, Sally Carroll. Hi. How you all? Sally Carroll, demanded Marilyn as they started off again. You engaged? Lordy, where'd all this start? Can't I look at a man without everybody in town engaging me to him? Clark stared straight in front of him at a bolt on the clattering windshield. Sally Carroll, he said with a curious intensity, don't you like us? What? us down here. Why, Clark, you know I do. I adore all you boys. Then why are you getting engaged to a Yankee? Clark, I don't know. I'm not sure what I'll do. But, well, I want to go places and see people. I want my mind to grow. I want to live where things happen on a big scale. What you mean? Oh, Clark, I love you. And I love Joe here, and Ben Arrett, and you all, but you'll, you'll... We'll all be failures? Yes, I don't mean only money failures, but just sort of, of ineffectual and sad, and, oh, how can I tell you? You mean because we stay here in Tarleton? Yes, Clark, and because you like it, and never want to change things, or think, or go ahead. He nodded, and she reached over and pressed his hand. Clark, she said softly, I wouldn't change you for the world. You're sweet the way you are. The things that'll make you fail, I'll love always. The living in the past, the lazy days and nights you have, and all your carelessness and generosity. But you're going away. Yes, because I couldn't ever marry you. You've a place in my heart no one else ever could have. But tied down here, I'd get restless. I'd feel I was wasting myself. There's two sides of me, you see. There's the sleepy old side you love, and there's a sort of energy, the feeling that makes me do wild things. That's the part of me that may be useful somewhere, that'll last when I'm not beautiful any more. She broke off with characteristic suddenness and sighed, Oh, sweet cookie, as her mood changed. Half closing her eyes and tipping back her head till it rested on the seat back, she let the savory breeze fan her eyes and ripple the fluffy curls of her bobbed hair. They were in the country now, hurrying between tangled growths of bright green coppice and grass and tall trees that sent sprays of foliage to hang a cool welcome over the road. Here and there they passed a battered negro cabin, its oldest white-haired inhabitant, smoking a corn-cob pipe beside the door and half a dozen scantily clothed piccaninnies parading tattered dolls on the wild-grown grass in front. 
Farther out were lazy cotton fields, where even the workers seemed intangible shadows lent by the sun to the earth, not for toil, but to while away some age-old tradition in the golden September fields. And round the drowsy picturesqueness, over the trees and shacks and muddy rivers, flowed the heat, never hostile, only comforting, like a great, warm, nourishing bosom for the infant earth. "'Sally Carroll, we're here.' Poor child, sound asleep. Honey, you dead at last out of sheer laziness? Water, Sally Carroll. Cool water waiting for you. Her eyes opened sleepily. Hi, she murmured, smiling. 